This evening, as in the last lecture, I shall be sharing the lecture with Nevenka Trom. We're also joined this evening by Anusha Hag Hagdadi, who runs or is involved with an organization called Remembering Srebrenica, and there will be material from that organization available at the end of the lecture. In the last lecture, we explained how genocide as a crime developed, how difficult it was to prove a breach of the Genocide Convention when seeking to prove crime of state against state. To some extent, I argued that even if the crime of genocide is hard to define and hard to prove, it should be dealt with as a crime, because to do so reflects, reflects the public will. We also considered Ben Ferens's proposal to extend the definition or application of crimes against humanity that would move towards courts being able to outlaw war. In this lecture, we're looking again at Srebrenica with a focus on how to prove the required mental state against an individual charged with the crime. What on earth were people, leaders and all others doing? What were they thinking of when they engaged in mass killing of up to 8,000 people? But first, a homely analogy, but for a purpose. If there is a robbery or a burglary of a security vault in Hatton Garden, involving a Mr. Big, you might have in mind, those of you who remember it, the Italian job, and Mr. Bridger, played by Noel Coward, with lieutenants who plan the operation and men on the ground who go in and commit the burglary or the robbery. Each one of them, once caught, will be shown to have a very simple mental state. They intended to burgle or to rob the deposit boxes. Nothing like that can happen when you look for the mental state of those who are charged with the crime of genocide. Let me remind you, we've looked at it before, but very briefly, what is the test, the test that has to be proved in the mind of someone for the crime of genocide? For the purposes of that, this statute, this comes from the International Criminal Court, means certain acts, which are killing and causing serious bodily harm and other acts, mean certain acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. Not exactly the words that are rolling round the head of any intending criminal, uh, genocidaire or otherwise, but that's the test that has to be met. There have been several Srebrenica cases that included allegations of genocide. All of them effectively accepted that General Mladic, still on trial, was at the centre of the criminality. His defence, which is still going on, seemed based, seems to be based on the assertion that things simply happened, didn't happen, in the way that many, many witnesses have said they did. Should he be acquitted of genocide, several other decisions of the Yugoslav Tribunal will have to be reconsidered. The first ICTY Yugoslav Tribunal case where genocide was found to have happened at Srebrenica was a case called Kostic. The latest is Ptolemyr, which was a case confirmed on appeal as recently as last month. I have annexed to the papers that you'll get when you leave this evening a brief summary of the facts from that case of what happened at Srebrenica. I'll outline it in the briefest possible terms as follows. You'll remember where Bosnia and Herzegovina are um, in relation to Serbia. Your, the green patch now of Bosnia is the part of the Serb-dominated territories that it was hoped could be joined, joined on to Srebrenica, to uh, Serbia on the right. Srebrenica, you can see, I'm afraid I couldn't find a map that shows this general outline that had all the towns I wanted to show on it. But there you can see Srebrenica. Here you can see Srebrenica and also Garajda, one of the other safe havens at the bottom with Sarajevo there in the middle. And here you can also see Srebrenica and just below it there, Zepa, which is another one of the other three towns concerned and one of the towns that fell to the Bosnian Serb forces in July of 19. 95. Now, the trial chamber in the last case um, found that, no, I beg your pardon, I should just, just say a little bit more about 
the, the, the events uh, of the Srebrenica massacre. Um, the safer areas had been identified by the United Nations. The Bosnian Serbs were attacking them. They announced in a very famous directive that they were going to make life in Srebrenica intolerable, that people would be forced out. There was a clear plan to force people out. Srebrenica fell on the 11th of July of 1995. You've seen a little bit of Mladic walking through the town saying it was a case of revenge against the Muslims and he was making a gift of the town to Serbia. Thereafter, men were separated from women in two different ways. Either they went to the United Nations compound and they were separated directly, or they went on a march to try and escape, 10 to 16,000 of them on a march to try and escape what they knew was coming. Many of them were arrested, brought back to the United Nations compound where men were separated from women. They were taken away to various sites and simply killed en masse. One site, a warehouse, I think a 1,000 people pushed inside, machine guns and grenades just thrown in at them in order to kill them. Scenes on fields where people were lined up and killed. What on earth is it that gets into the state of mind of people that they can commit these offences? That's what we are concerned uh, with here tonight. Now, that much then from the... Uh, case of Ptolemyr, which happens to be the last case and we hope is consistent with all others. And it wasn't surprising that the, 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 the appeals chamber, because most cases do trial chamber and appeals, the appeals chamber had no difficulty in finding that the level of harm inflicted on men and indeed the women who were uh, under terrible pressure constituted genocide. They could easily see that the test of genocide overall, and by some people, had been established. And as to that other town of Jeppa, which fell, uh, people actually gave in, really, in Jeppa because they knew what was in store for them. But nevertheless, for certain particular reasons, the chamber also found that uh, genocide was committed there. And the judgment, which you've got in slightly longer form in the printed handout, gives some clue as to how genocide is proved in court. There are, of course, central issues I can't deal with, numbers of people killed, importance of people for their community, and that sort of thing, which featured in the Jeppa case. But when it comes to the mental state that has to be proved, was it proved that there was this intent to destroy a group in whole or in part? You can't go straight to the revealed mental state of one or other potential <coughs> defendant and say, well, he or she had that state, then everybody did. Nor can you go to the overall project and say, here's the overall project, like the robbery of the safety deposit vault up the road, and say, well, everybody who did it had that. It simply isn't like that. So how was mental state for these crimes, genocide and other mass crimes, established in the tribunal? Well, there are a number of cases, but Kerstich, the first case, as I told you, was one where he was charged with genocide, and convicted of genocide by um, the trial chamber. Um, on appeal, uh, the appeal judges said, oh, well, this is circumstantial evidence, but that's okay. And they then said, on the other hand, if uh, the trial chamber says, well, uh, General Mladic knew what was going on with all the killings, therefore Mr. Kerstich, who was uh, a general major in the army of the Republic of Serb Serbska and commander of the corps which was responsible for the area where all this was happening, they said, well, the trial chamber said, well, if Mladic knew, Kerstic must have known. There were also three very famous meetings at Bratunac, a town nearby, um, on the 11th and 12th of July at the Hotel Fontana, where Mladic terrorised the representatives of the Bosnian um, community, telling them, uh, quit or you'll be destroyed, basically. A most threatening um, uh, presence, which has been shown on film, as you've seen either this time or the last. Um, the appeals chamber said, oh, well, maybe not. Uh, it's unlikely that Mladic would be revealing his genocidal intent to this very senior soldier. And so they, overall, came to a rather complicated set of conclusions, which meant that Kerstich was not left convicted of genocide, but he was left with aiding and abetting genocide because some of his troops were going to be used. 
He must have been aware that other troops would be necessary to do that which was genocidal. So aid and abet for him. Well, that's the way lawyers spent their time. Um, you may think that this, as one of a number of cases, shows how difficult it is to reach a common decision, even within judges. Indeed, how it almost looks as though judges have the ability to exercise a discretion when they're dealing with a case like this. They don't, of course, exercise a discretion. Judges have to make findings, findings of fact. So that perhaps Kerstich begins to show some of the difficulties that there are in pinning an individual with the very precise uh, definition of genocide. Uh, let me just tell you this. Um, one of the witnesses we called was a man called Dr. Zvan, Dr. Tom Zvan, who was a genocide expert. We're going to come to him again later. He said nothing specific at all about Yugoslavia. He spoke of other scenes of uh, mass atrocities and cases called genocide. And he told the judges, I was very surprised they allowed him to be called, but he told the judges various things about um, how genocide comes into play. And in particular, that when you see people committing terrible crimes on the ground and you can't see where the connection is between them and the political leaders, there is a connection. The puppeteer's lines are there. It's just that you can't see them. And that was his evidence, or part of his evidence. And you might say to yourself, well, uh, if what he's saying, if there is this sort of unity of conduct from the top down, surely there must be some common mental state in all those people who are at the end of the puppeteer's strings. Maybe. More of Dr. Zwan later. Now, some uh, defendants charged with Srebrenica offences pleaded guilty. Pleading guilty in the Yugoslav tribunal is a somewhat unusual thing for the judges to, to accept. It's common in our jurisdiction. In other jurisdictions, it's much less common. And I'm just going to play you bits of, eventually, a couple of very short passages from two people who did plead guilty. But first, let me tell you something about them. A, a, young, a young man called Drajan Ademovic was one of the uh, sabotage detachments of the Bosnian Serb army. And he was present when loads of people, of men, were delivered to the area where he was in a bus. They were taken out of the bus, they were lined up, uh, and they all had to be shot. And he engaged in shooting of them, hundreds of them. He explained that he had to do this because if he'd refused, he'd been told, well, you can join the line and we'll shoot you as well. He had a wife and family. He said, what was my choice? So here was a man charged with hundreds of killings, which he accepted, not as genocide, but uh, nevertheless, um, killings. Uh, I can't remember the crime he had was um, murder as violations of the customs of war. I'll tell you his sentence in a minute. And um, I think... I have lost many very good friends of all nationalities only because of that war, and I am convinced that all of them all of my friends were not in favor of a war. I am convinced of that, but simply they had no other choice. This war came and there was no way out. And the same happened to me. Because of my case, because of everything that happened, I, of my own will, without being either arrested, interrogated, or put under pressure, admitted, even before I, I was arrested in the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, I admitted to what I did to this journalist. There it is in writing, and he ends up by explaining, because of everything that happened, I feel terribly sorry, but I couldn't do anything. When I could do something, I did. I have nothing else to say. I'll come back to him after we look at the next one, a senior, more senior officer, Dragan Abrenovich, Deputy Commander-in-Chief of Staff of the Zvornik Brigade, which was responsible for the area where the mass of the executions took place. He was acting commander of the Zvornik Brigade at the particular time, a dignified soldier. Uh, and he was convicted by the court, in his case of an offense of persecutions, because he didn't, he didn't stop 
what he could have stopped. And it was his inaction that led to his trial and his uh, conviction. He, he was convicted and sentenced to 17 years for what he did. And this is part of what he said. There was no choice. You could be either a soldier or a traitor. At the beginning of the war, it seemed as if the war and all it brought with it was impossible, that this wasn't really happening to us, and that everything would be resolved within a few days, and that finally our generation would have a chance. We didn't even notice how we were drawn into the vortex of interethnic hatred and how neighbors were no longer able to live beside each other, how death moved into the vicinity, and we didn't even notice that we had got used to it. Death became our reality. He went on to explain how they lost the habit of having coffee neighbor with neighbor and said, I'm to blame for everything I did at the time. I'm not trying to erase and to be what I was not at the time. I'm also to blame for I would, what I did not do. 17 years for him, five years for the first man, Ademovich. But what we see in their statements, and I don't believe there's much else in the material that amplifies this, is no explanation of what their mental state was at the time they committed. They weren't charged with genocide, but it doesn't matter. They're looking back with sorrow, regret, guilt, shame, trying to atone for what they did. Let's look at another one very briefly. Um, Momir Nikolic was the first uh, Bosnian Serb to acknowledge guilt. In his case, again, persecutions. He got 20 years. And he said, I sincerely wish before this chamber and before the public to express my deep and sincere remorse and regret. He went on, I'm aware that I cannot bring back the dead. I wish to contribute to the full truth being established about Srebrenica and the victims there. And by my guilty plea, I wanted to help the tribunal and the prosecutors. Next paragraph, Your Honours, I feel that my confession is an important step towards the rebuilding of confidence and coexistence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So these are people who pleaded guilty Maybe there was an element of self-interest in pleas of guilty, as there always may be. But if you read what they say looking back, are these men who you think would have had something approaching that particularly wicked, if almost unintelligible, definition of genocide, the crime of the mass crimes that are so often being charged against these people? Now, moving on from... Uh, Nikolic, before I come to the point of asking you to consider these people, there were two others who very recently been finally convicted on appeal of genocide. They didn't plead. Beara on the left and Popovich on the right. Their cases also went through the uh, appeals chamber, but these were men, middle-ranking soldiers, and they were dealt with as to their commission of the crime of genocide. Really quite briefly, if you look at the judgment, I provided extracts in the papers. So far as Popovich on the right is concerned, he knew the intent of his senior officers was not just to kill those who'd fallen into the hands of Bosnian Serb forces, but to kill as many as possible with the aim of destroying the group. So they found from the things he did and the things he said that he met the definition of genocide. Bayara on the left in, engaged in vigorous exercise to organize locates, uh, locations and places where people could be killed to recruit personnel, to secure equipment, and to oversee convictions. And he announced publicly, according to one witness, as it were, an intent to kill all detained men and then became vigorously enthusiastic in finding ways of doing it. So it's not surprising and it's quite interesting that it's at this mid-level. It's not surprising that these two men were convicted of genocide, as was Ptolemy, the last man I'm going to mention. And Ptolemy was a very senior figure indeed, very close to Mladic. The evidence against him was really quite overwhelming. His enthusiasm as Mladic's 
right hand, his eyes and ears, closer to being an equal to Mladic. He was kept aware of everything that Mladic was ordering and doing, and he was enthusiastic in putting it into effect. He played a coordinating role in the genocide that the court has already found happened, because you remember it was from this case that I summarized very briefly the uh, facts of uh, the massacres at Srebrenica. He was also found, for example, to encourage the use of derogatory terms amongst the Muslim Serb forces uh, about the Bosnian Muslims. And so the, the, the appeals chamber had no trouble in, in finding that he had the knowledge of the genocidal intent. There's one very troubling thing about the Ptolemy case. The trial chamber of three judges, on really overwhelming evidence, was split 2 one. One judge found him not guilty of everything. The appeals chamber of five judges had one judge who supported the minority judge. How can that be? And what on earth will the victims think of a process like this? And what will be the long-term effects of a process like this that will allow people in future generations to say, well, that wasn't genocide at all. Look at the minority judge's view. She took a different view. She thought he was not guilty. And so did that judge in the appeals chamber, that French judge. He found him not guilty as well. Well, the, the point of looking at all of these cases, and very briefly, is simply this. None of these cases, summarised in the very uh, severe way I have, of course, reveals very much, if anything, about the true mental state of the individual offender. And one of the reasons for that, to which we will return, is this. People committing crimes of this kind do it for all sorts of reasons. Because they want to. Because they like killing. Because they hate the people that they're killing. Because they hate the group of people that, uh, from whom the people they're about to kill come. That they're frightened of themselves being killed. That they're drunk. That they're drugged. And their intention this morning may be different from their intention this afternoon. That's the reality of this type of activity. And you may understand how difficult it is to squeeze these people directly into a single criminal category. However, even if they don't share a common mental intent in the way that the Hatton Garden burglars might, th there is one other individual or sort of individual, with whom they are likely all to be connected. And in most mass atrocity crimes, there is such a figure with whom they are correct connected. And it's a body, an individual not, a body, that has within it the genocidal intent. And it is to that body, to that entity, that each of these people in different ways are connected. In this case, and so far as the crimes committed by the Serbs are concerned, the entity that had the intent was the Serb state. And it had it for a long time, in part, because for over 150 years, there has been a, a Serb state project that would have permitted or allowed or encouraged this state of mind of a state to come into being. And Avenka Trump will tell us about that. 19th century was an interesting century. It was a century of huge changes in Europe. And I will start with a proposition, which is a proposition that uh, not only locally, um, wars were happening, but every war in the Balkans was a part of a big European war. There was a big U European war, and after the war, there was a peace conference. And the statehood, Jeffrey, can I have the papers? Uh, and the Serbian statehood started with an interesting proposition, thank you, and 
that is that after a great war that was that started in 1876 there came a peace conference berlin peace conference where serbia became an independent state and from that moment on there is a european trend that uh, empires were diminishing and they were replaced by a nation states nation states as a concept one nation in one state was imported to the balkans from develop best in this case it was a french model but how could one have such a state with a patchwork of nations living intermingled with each other without coming in trouble with the other national groups. Uh, this is where the Serbian state project or Serbian state ideology came into being. And this Serbian state ideology is, uh, had different development than other similar state ideologies, for example, Polish state project, where it was relatively easier to have one nation, one state, because there was not such a difficult and complicated ethnic makeup. But for Serbia, it was different. And why it was different? It was different for several reasons. And one of the reasons was that Serb ethnic corpus didn't live under Ottoman rule only. It lived scattered all over the Balkans as a part of Habsburg Air Empire and Ottoman Empire. And at the moment that these empires were diminishing or disappearing, Serbian Strait project was uh, based on the premise that they might be able to have a Serbian state that would actually incorporate all Serbs living in other parts of the Balkans as well. And there was a coin since that time, and it was greater Serbia ideology and greater Serbia ambition. By itself, there is nothing wrong to have such ambition. We have greater Great Britain as well. And what made Serbian state project potentially dangerous for the others was that it had this imperial element to it and incorporating parts of the Balkan not only based on ethnicity but also on other criteria. I will give you a very quick run of the historical documents that left a mark, significant mark, and on the Serbian internal policies, the mark on the Balkans, but also on Europe, as we know where the First World War started, after all. And we will ex I will explain shortly why. The first document was something called Nacertanie, the outline. It was written in 1844 by Ilya Garashanin, a politician, mi Minister of Foreign Affairs and later uh, very influential, uh, he proposed, uh, in this case, before the Great European War in 1876, that a future Serbian state should actually be restoration of the medieval Serbian state under Dusan the Mighty. You understand that he picked actually the part in the history when Serbia was the largest ever. The borders of Dusan the Mighty went actually to the Greek and it incorporated uh, it Greek territory, incorporated Macedonia and Kosovo, Bosnia. So this was one of the important elements that not only Serb, greater Serbian ideology wanted uh, and had pretension to incorporate territories, but it had to be also um, geostrategic criteria and restoration of the 
so-called historical Serb territories. This document was kept secret as published only in 1906. And it is a trend that somewhere, somehow, those Serbian elites who uh, produced such documents understood the problem. Because if you want to incorporate Serb ethnic territories, it might be fine. But if you want to incorporate large territories with no Serb population, how are you going to do it? Maybe by violence. We'll see. So the next um, important um, document is um, called, uh, it is called, uh, it, it came from a unification or death organization that had a manifesto. And this was a militant organization that came into being in uh, around 1900. And they were very determined that Serbia should compete with Austrian Hungary for Bosnian and Herzegovina territories. Why? Berlin uh, Congress uh, awarded Serbia with a kingdom, but uh, historical territories, Kosovo and Macedonia, still remained under Ottoman Empire. And Bosnia and Herzegovina was made a protectorate of Habsburg Empire. And these three territories were primary ambition of Serbia to achieve. The uh, unification or death um, organized the assassination of Obrenovic dynasty because this dynasty had a close ties with Austrian uh, Hungary. So interesting element here is not to go back to the whole history, but just to see that they were prepared to achieve their goals by terrorism, violence, and later we'll see even with mass, by mass atrocities. And this sort of uh, line in Serb policy at that time, it was not a mainstream policy, but it was something that had been cult cultivated generation by generation in a and it always was like a red thread in a political spectrum in Serbia. This same group organized assassination of Franz Ferdinand in 1914. Why? Before, because Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908. And because of protestation of that and seeing the Habsburg Empire and Vienna as the prime uh, rival, they arranged the assassination. We know what came after that. Again, a great European war, and after that war, a peace conference. And in this peace conference, Serbia actually became uh, a part of um, uh, a common Slav state. And for many historians, and for many Serb historians, that should be a reason why Serbia did not have imperialistic ambitions. They say, how could they? Because they opted for a Yugoslavia to will to live on an equal footing with other South Slav ethnic groups. Uh, there is a contesting view about what Yugoslavia as a common state meant for the Serbs. There, this contesting view says that for Serbia, it was actually ideal geopolitical unit because it did incorporate all other territories claimed our religious, geostrategic, uh, historical, and ethnic claims. And they would accept only a Yugoslavia, which is Serb-dominated and centralized country. And first Yugoslavia was an exercise to make a state although incorporating others, Serb-dominated states. And for many historians, it was reason why it basically failed before it uh, disintegrated because of the Nazi conquest. The Second World War was a complicated and very significant um, culmination of different contesting extreme right ideologies primarily Serb uh, ideology and um, uh, creation, 
state ideology. And in the history, we call it uh, clash, there is an approach to call it clash of the state projects. Uh, Serbia did not have any contestant to the territories as important as Croats. And where they clashed is within Bosnia Herzegovina. This document is, falls into the line of development of greater Serbia ideology because it proposed the borders that went very, very far to the uh, west, cutting Croatia into two. And the line, which is not very visible here, but it is called Virovitica Karlovas Karlovag line, which was important to uh, remember because it features uh, as an important geostrategic uh, concept in the recent wars in Yugoslavia. So what is important here with the greater Serbian ideology that is not a term fixed in time. You cannot say it started in the 19th century, it was bottled and every time we needed it, we simply opened the bottle. No, it evolved and developed with Europe and European constellation of powers. And this concept of course never worked out, but what worked out, what, what is uh, one of the important uh, repeating feature is what is going to happen with Bosnia and Herzegovina once Serbia sets out to achieve uh, and to expand its western borders. Uh, so uh, Greater Serbia uh, as a clash of state project is uh, uh, something that um, does still uh, to this day uh, plays a very important role. Uh, what happened in the, um, after the Second World War is yet another peace conference, Yalta Peace Conference. And we, I think we recently in February uh, marked 70th anniversary of it. Uh, three um, European leaders two European leaders and an American leader uh, decided to, uh, to divide Europe in influence spheres. Yugoslavia is a product of this sort of post uh, Second World War thinking and it became a Yugoslav Federation. Things changed for Serbia. Serbia became one of six equal republics. There was an equilibrium, there is a policy of consensus, um, meaning that even Slovenia and Macedonia were very small, but in the decision-making process, they had one vote, just like Serbia. There was no proportionality uh, related to how big the nation was. So for decades, everyone thought things were going okay, but don't forget it was a Cold War, and Pax Sovietica, regulated the Eastern Bloc and the Western uh, capitalist bloc made sure that there were no big uh, problems and security issues. So Yugoslavia remained contained between these two bi uh, in the bipolar world. And then as expected, when Tito died, a strong man of Yugoslavia, uh, there were concerns what would happen with Yugoslavia. So where did, uh, did these concerns come from? First of all, uh, from the last communist constitution from 1974, when actually uh, Yugoslavia became a de facto federation, confederation, and Serbs, uh, Serbian side did not accept it because the old sort of thinking about a common state came back and a Yugoslavia they could uh, accept would only be a centralized federation. So what happened, Tito, Tito is still alive, so what happens, uh, Serbian Communist Party commissions a document called Blue Book where they try to analyze why there is such a 
uprising among, among the Serbian intellectuals, uh, mostly um, lawyers, professors of a law faculty of Belgrade, and they come to several quite interesting findings. Although this blue book remains secret again, public doesn't know anything about it. And what they actually find out is following. Since six republics had all the same rights before this constitution, there was a big change for Serbia because two provinces, autonomous provinces, became de facto republics. And why? Because they got the same vote on federal level as republics, but most importantly, they had so much autonomy that it was quite uh, difficult for Serbia to deal with. Why? Uh, because of this autonomy, uh, both provinces could have a vote and say in everything which was happening in Serbia, but not vice versa. Serbia from Belgrade couldn't vote and couldn't have the same influence in autonomous provinces. So there were ob obviously things to arrange, but it was left uh, untackled. So when Tito died, um, the unrests and problems started in Kosovo. And the next document, very important for development of Serbian, uh, greater Serbian ideology, was a document published in uh, 1986. Uh, it was published uh, by a newspaper in installments and the authors, members of Serbian Academy of uh, Science, Sciences and Arts, claimed that this was a leaked document that it should have never been uh, known to the public. And in this document, they actually tackled so many problems. First of all, the first part was about the functioning of federation and the Serbia being the only republic that was actually cut in three, and they wanted to change it. So to understand the place of Serbian greater ideology through the centuries, always having a different sort of form, and even appearing in a communism, in communist Yugoslavia in a certain form, is uh, to understand that it was not the only Serbian political oppression, uh, expression of their needs, and there was always a huge opposition to it. And the question would always be, which of these currents within Serbian politics will and might prevail? Uh, 1986 was very important, because although minor in a whole spectrum of social factors in Serbia, it did eventually prevail. And why? Because the project found its leader. And this leader was Slobodan Milosevic. He took up the proposition from this interesting and not very exciting document, if you read it, and he made it a practicing political program. And in this program, Serbs endeavored to change the status and of the provinces and eventually of the makeup of Yugoslav uh, federation. So what we did during the Milosevic trial, we had to understand how and what this greater Serbian ideology uh, featured in uh, conquest of the territories. So we identified five different plans. First is a plan to centralize Serbia, which Milosevic did successfully by changing Serbian constitution in 1990. After that, to change, to centralize Yugoslav Federation, not back to pre-1974 times, but even more centralized than that. And this is where he failed, and this is where the violence started. Why? Slovenia and Croatia being engaged in dialogue about a future Yugoslav state, wanted confederation, and at a moment that that wasn't possible, they um, declared independence. The third uh, important part of this um, 
evolved in Greater Serbia was the war in Croatia. And this is where end criminality and criminal mens rea, criminal intent came into being. Because the Serbs were conquering the territories, not only where Serbs had majority, but geostrategic uh, parts where, where the Croats were in majority. And this is in these parts, this is where the crimes happened. And for us, the most important part is actually Bosnia. What was happening in Bosnia, in Herzegovina? In the last um, lecture, we have showed you the um, ethnic makeup of Bosnia. And um, in connection with uh, this makeup, the Serbs endeavored to form their own entity, Republika Srpska. And how this concept of Greater Serbia was working is best to see here. These red parts in Croatia is Republika Sr uh, Srpska Krajina, and these reds here are Republika Srpska. And if you connect it, and if you see it, how it works with um, Serbia proper, then you see actually that these uh, green spots, in this case in Bosnia, had actually to be red. And this is where geostrategic conquests of Serbia started. And to go back to, uh, so this is the map uh, uh, at the beginning of the war in 92 with Serb conquests. This is the map of something called Van Oven Plan. And you, on this map, you can al also see why the war went on after 93, because this is another map. You still see the problems with the uh, green areas. And this is the map actually where the Serbian conquest finished in 95, and this is the map of post-Dayton map. This is how Bosnia looked like, and you can see that the places where Srebrenica uh, were, were actually now red. And all these green areas are the color areas that became red. We know that there were crimes that happened there. So uh, this is the moment where Sir Jeffrey is going to take over. What we've heard is that a national idea understood by the leaders at the time to have the potential for violence had to be kept a bit under wraps. But it was always understood, whether in the manifestations of the First World War or in other interesting manifestations of behavior by the Serbs throughout the period of time, it was always understood that this project was there, bubbling up, sometimes quietening down. And it was only ever going to be by somebody embracing the project in the way that Milosevic ultimately did that would take things forward, but would take them forward with violence. Something that the people he was going to have to work with knew was an inevitability. And that brings me back to how I started this. Individuals might not themselves have had an intention to do these terribly violent things, but they knew that there was a project to put all Serbs in the same state. They knew that this was a project that couldn't really survive the disintegration of the former Yugoslavia, and they knew it could only happen by violence. So when it started to happen, when it had state approval, with different mental states, they themselves, you may judge from what you've heard about the people who were convicted and found guilty, were prepared to lend their support. But the thing about a major state project one that lasts for 150 years, as Nena has explained here, is that it needs a driver. But if the driver doesn't do any good, and Milosevic drove it for a time and failed, he will be shipped and forgotten. And he is now forgotten. In Serbia, he's almost, not completely, but he's, a, he's already passing into history. And is, a, is that because the whole project's died? Quite possibly not. The project may be alive and waiting for
for someone else to pick up the reins. And it may indeed be recognition of the sort of risks that a state project of this kind brings lies behind the enthusiasm of the international community to get Serbia into, into Europe. Because there is a great level of enthusiasm to have that happen. Because it will be safer to have a country that has a potential for danger inside the uh, comforting, federated nature of the Europe that we are apparently wishing to leave, or some of us. As to Milotovic himself, um, he, of course, died before the end of his trial, and the judges had a chance to review whether there was enough evidence against him to let the case of genocide go ahead beyond the end of the prosecution's case. And just as with those other cases where the generals were found guilty of whatever they were found guilty with and the intermediate ranks and so on, the judges largely based it on individual acts that he did from which they could infer his mental state because he made no confessions himself. Indeed, he never used the term Greater Serbia himself. He recognised in one particular intercepted conversation that the term was a dangerous one to use. He let the term be used by others and did things that could possibly bring it about. The sort of things that the trial chamber, looking at the submissions made at the end of the prosecution's case by the Amici on behalf of Milosevic, the things that they relied upon were um, odd things, he said, that gave away his recognition that the Bosnian Serbs who he was supporting had clearly murderous intent. He endorsed without letting the words come from himself. The sort of things that Rad uh, Radovan Karadzic would say about chasing the Muslims altogether out of their territory in order to link up to the Serb territories. He wouldn't say it himself, but he'd endorse it in some way or another when another uh, said it in his presence. He recognised that they would have to annex part of Bosnia in order to make those connecting red lines that Nena has just, not red lines, those red passages that could join up with the pinkish colour of Serbia there on the right. And the judges concluded on the basis of a great deal of evidence that there was enough evidence for his genocide trial to go ahead. Now, we don't know, do we, how in future centuries what we've been doing here with these trials will be regarded as a first step on the way to a better future, or because they'll certainly be regarded as primitive. What happened 200 years ago is often primitive, or usually primitive. Um, what we're doing will be a first step somewhere. Will it be a first step in the right direction, or will it in some way seem to be an irrelevant witch hunt? We simply don't know at the moment. But Milosevic himself um, was an interesting chap. I meant to show you this. I'll just show it to you now. In one of his speeches to the judges, uh, Milosevic said this about Srebrenica. He said, I heard about Srebrenica from Karl Bildt and Karadzic, whom I rang on the phone immediately afterwards to ask what happened. He swore he knew nothing about it. On the contrary, he said he'd ordered that the West Park should be protected. Well, this was just plainly untrue. It's contrary to all the evidence. It's what I suppose you might say it was a lie. Um, now, before we come to that, I'm going to just go and play you, I think, something else. Just play you this, and then we will come back to what I was about to show you. Uh, this seemed improbable on the face of it. He was the president of a different country. And so I simply asked him, I said, Mr. President, you say you have uh, so much influence over the Bosnian Serbs, but how is it then, if you have such influence, that you allowed uh, General Mladic to kill all those people in Srebrenica? And Milosevic looked at me. He then said, well, General Clark, I warned Milosevic not to do this, but he didn't listen to me. He was answering that he did know this in advance, and he was walking the fine line between saying he was powerful enough, influential enough to have known it, but trying to excuse from himself the responsibility for having done it. Get out of there, Clark. 
To je notorna laž. Prvo zato što o Srebrenici uopšte nismo razgovarali. A drugo zato što ja za sve vreme, za sve te godine, nikada nisam izdao ni jednu naredbu generalu Mladiću, niti bio u poziciji da mu izdaje. The witness doesn't know what orders you uh, addressed to Mladic. He can't answer questions about what you may or may not have ordered to Mladic. General Clark, ja, na primer, i danas čvrsto verujem da general Mladic nije naredio nikakvo streljanje ljudi u Srebrenici. Da je to učinila grupa plaćenika. How would you expect Milosevic's state of mind to be sorted out had the judges got to the end of this exercise. He lied to the court. He was confronted with a bit of evidence by General Wesley Clark and he pr produced a positively absurd proposition, contrary to all the evidence. We had Milosevic on uh, tape in conversation or revealing that he'd been on conversation with Mladic on the, the very day that, that uh, Srebrenica happened and finding out what, it, what had happened. How would you expect the mental state of this man to be dealt with? I don't know. And how important is it now that he's a faded star, now that he's stopped driving the Serbian project train, how important is it to know what his mental state is if it's more important to know what the overall drive of the state itself was. Because you may think that without a project, without, in other circumstances, an ethnic hatred, perhaps shared by a large number of countries, without some political philosophy to which you can associate yourself, people would not do the things that those men we looked at earlier did. Well. Let's go back to the state and let's go back to Tom Zwan. Because Dr. Zwan, the expert, um, gave evidence, and I was not only surprised that he was accepted by the chamber, but I noted that the chamber, in their decision about whether the case should go ahead on genocide, without saying they accepted what Dr. Zwan had told us, and remember, Zvan said nothing about Yugoslavia. He just spoke about other genocides. He explained what the circumstances are that allow these types of mass crimes to be committed. And we have to think not only whether the Serbs were living, and the Bosnian Serbs as well, were living in a culture that had these features, but we may want to start thinking how many of these features exist in our societies as we live in a Europe that becomes more and more inclined to return, perhaps, to national interests and to national identities. And Zvan explained that you have to have an ideology, an ideology. Well, as Nena has explained, there was an ideology in Serbia for 150 years, and one that everybody knew you had to suppress. You have to have propaganda that plays a role in the processes leading to the commission of genocide. Well, he was found, was Milosevic, as a manipulator of the press and a propagator of propaganda. The propaganda has to involve various types of radical nationalism, said Dr. Zvan, which dehumanize the targeted group. Do we need to start worrying in our own countries about groups that may seem justifiably dehumanized? He explained that the use of collective historical memory can create an us and them culture, which is part of the necessary prerequisite of mass violence. Is that something that's entirely strange to us? He explained that nationalistic ideologies are later used to justify what was done. Does that make sense? 
made sense to the judges. And then he made this point, which is a point that I said we'd return to. He said, individual motives for participating in the acts, the acts of genocide or mass atrocities, may be varied. And you remember I suggested to you earlier that the individual killing may have a different plan this morning from this afternoon and different from the man next door, but he's associated generally with a bigger plan to which they can all be connected. And this was the way that Dr. Zvan explained that. He said, ideologies give an overall sense of direction to what should be done and impart a sense of purpose and intent to individual perpetrators. He also explained, which is something we looked at last week, last time rather, that genocide is a crime of the state and that the overall perception, attitude, behaviour and decision of the central political leadership are decisive factors. And that genocide crimes, remember, the puppeteer's strings, invisible but they're there, are always top down, never bottom up. And that they occur with the knowledge and approval and involvement of the state authorities. It's when you find these features in a society, and there are other similar analyses of how genocide and similar crimes are committed, it's when you find these features present in society that the society is at risk of doing what happened in Srebrenica. And of course Milosevic and uh, probably the others, Ptolemy in particular maybe, were people who, by the time they came to do what they did, were people you really wouldn't want to have around for dinner. Um, they had, for some reason, by some process, become coarsened. And maybe, yes, they had precisely... We don't know about Milosevic. We know what the judges have found about others. Maybe they had that very precise mental state that the crime of genocide requires. But should we... And it's not a question I answer, I simply ask it of you um, and hope that the staff may allow us five minutes for questions, although we run over time. But I ask again the question, as we try and learn from what happened at Srebrenica, should we be focusing on individuals who come and go if we want to try and stop these crimes? Or should we be focusing on the reality that these are state crimes and that our international duty, or our national duty, is to ensure that states, once they start to manifest these characteristics, are in some way called to account? From this, we must all learn. Thank you very much.